Welcome to Yair Davidi's international reach out to Judah and the Ten Tribes. It's a great honor and pleasure to be here. I'm happy I was able to get here. Hey, and we're in the month of Kislev. You know, Kislev means the words of our Hebrew month have deep meanings, which I'm not going to go into it, but it means concealment and it means renewal, revelation. And do you know that according to our sources, there's a spark of Messiah within everybody, within all of Israel. And it's our job to ignite that, to ignite that spark and bring it out to its fullest potential. And this is a special month for doing that. And so I wish everyone good luck in doing that. And I wish we all should know that that's you are carrying the sparks of Messiah. You are weaving the tapestry of Messianism, of redemption. As an intro, is another thing I wanted to say in case we get erupt, interrupted, you know, earthquake, tsunami, meteorite. Another really important thing I wanted to say is that I think a general title for Yair Davidi's writings can be taken from the last two words of a biblical verse. The day is yours, the night also. It was you who set it in place, the orb of the sun, Psalm 74. This title is appropriate for the collections of Yair's teachings because his teachings provide light for Israel and the world and his works illuminate with light like the light of the seven days of creation when the sun shone upon the world. And I think that's just important to get off my chest that his works could be called light or enlightening. Um, where should I start? Someone has a, uh, an idea for me? I was thinking that in the book of Deuteronomy becomes the command to remember. Remember that you were a slave in Egypt, Deuteronomy 5, 14, 15, 15, 16, 12, 24, 18, 24, 22. Remember what Amalek did to you, the first anti-Judah, anti-Yaakov, anti-Israel. That's Deuteronomy 25. Remember what God did to Miriam, Deuteronomy 24. Remember the days of old. Consider the generations long past. Ask your father and he will tell you. Your elders and they will explain it to you, Deuteronomy 32. Um, by the way, guys, people are trying to give us a different interpretation of our own faith. But we ha actually have that continuity, this dialogue we have with our great, great, grandmothers and grandfathers and our sages and our wise men and women go back 3,350 years. So it's a little ridiculous when someone's going to tell us what the Bible means to us. When we, we, keep, we kept that, remember the days of old, consider generations long past, ask your father and he will tell you. It doesn't tell us to ask a Anglican minister in England doesn't tell us to ask an Iman from Arabia. It says ask our own content covenantal faith community. That's an important thing. In Deuteronomy we have the Vidui Bikurim, which is the confession of the first fruits. And the entire history of the nation in summary form in this little confession in a few short sentences we have the patriotic origins in Mesopotamia, the emergence of the Hebrew nation in the midst of history rather than mythic, mythological prehistory, slavery in Egypt and the liberation therefrom, the climatic acquisition of the land of Israel, and throughout the acknowledgement of God as the Lord of history. You know, history in Hebrew, you can go like this, Hester Ka, Hester Ya, it's God's being hidden in front of us, just like nature takes hides the godliness in Hebrew teva it swallows it drowns you don't see the godliness same history God is hidden by history by the way I'm go, I'm using um, ideas from Rabbi Dr. Jonathan Sachs but I'm, I'm I feel I'm fixing the ideas and making it inclusive of our ten tribes we should note that we have an important nuance the Hebrew nation were the first people to find God in history. They were the first to think 
in historical terms of time as an arena of change as opposed to a cylindrical time in which the seasons rotate people are born and die but nothing changes so the Hebrew nation we were the first people to write history many centuries before Herodotus and Theocentius but the biblical Hebrew doesn't actually have a word for history. The closest equivalent is Divrei Ayamim, what you would call chronicles. Instead, it uses the root Zachor, meaning memory. There's a fundamental difference between history and memory. History is his story, an account of events that happened sometime else to someone else. Memory is my story. It's the past internalized and made part of my identity. That is what the Mishnah in Psachim means when it says each person must see themselves as if they personally went out, they personally exited Egypt. That's a Mishnah in Psachim, chapter 10, Mishnah 5. Um, throughout the book of Deuteronomy and Devorah, Moses warns the people no less than 14 times not to forget. If they forget the past, they will lose their identity and their sense of direction and disaster will follow. Moreover, not only are the people commanded to remember, they are also commanded to hand that memory to, on to their kindalach, to their children. This entire phenomenon represents a remarkable cluster of ideas about identity as a matter of collective memory, about the ritual t retelling of the nation, of the nation, nation story, about all, above all, about the fact that every one of us is a guardian of that story and memory. It is not the leader alone or some elite who are trained to recall the past, but every one of us. This too is an aspect of the devolution and democratic democracy of, of, of leadership that we find throughout biblical Judaism as a way of life. The great leaders tell the story of the group. Our sages tell the story of the group just like the greatest of our leaders, Moses taught the group to become a nation of storytellers. And we invite Ephraim to join the party. We invite the ten tribes to come and remember we're a Mamlechet Kohanim in Goy Kadosh. We're not, it's not the realm of the priest or the person who thinks they're speaking in tongues or the pastor or the minister or the reverend. We think that the whole nation are supposed to be like priests, you know, in the sense of teachers and learners. The whole nation are supposed to be uh, wise. So that's what Judah needs to do. We need to invite Ephraim to start telling the original story of our, of our joint past. Um, you can see the power of this idea today. If you visit the, I wanted to comment about the Ephraim and Menashe. If you visit the presidential memorials in Washington, you will see that each carries an inscription taken from their words. Jefferson, we hold these troops to be self-evident. Roosevelt, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Lincoln's Gettysburg address and his second inaugural with, with malice towards none, with charity towards all. Each memorial tells a story. Why is that? because America is mostly Menashe. And as you can probe Yair Davidi's amazing, fantastic, deep research, you'll understand that Menashe rep means representative government. London has no such equivalent. It contains many memorials and statues of historical leaders, each with a brief inscription stating who it represents, but there are no speeches or quotations. There is no story. Each, even the memorial to Winston Churchill whose speeches rivaled Lincoln's in power, bears only one word, Churchill. America has a national story in a society like, like England, also based on the covenant, but what's the big difference? The personality of Menashe. Menashe is a representative government. So the narrative is at the heart of the covenantal politics because it locates national identity in a set of historic events. The memory of those events evokes the values for which those who came before us fought and of which we are the guardians. So the covenantal narrative which England has not less than and Ephraim has not less than Menashe but they're two different sons of Joseph. They're different 
grandchildren of Jacob, and it reflected in the societies. So the, in, in the Menashe society, of course there's a mixture and there's a big balagan and there are all kinds of people, but in the essence, in the essence of the America, which is Menashe, the covenantal narrative is inclusive, the property of all its citizens, newcomers as well as the native born. It says to everyone, regardless of class or creed, this is who we are. It creates a sense of common identity that transcends other identities. That's why, for example, Martin Luther King Jr. was able to use such, if, such a, to such an effect in some of his greatest speeches. He was telling his fellow Americans, his fellow African Americans to see themselves as an equal part of the nation because that influence of Menashe influenced all the different ethnic groups there and at the same time he was telling the original Menashe Americans to honor their commitment to the Declaration of Independence where it stated that all men are created equal. England does not have the same kind of national narrative because it's it's based on the character trait essentially of Ephraim um, England writes Roger Scrutum, he uh, observes British history, he, he writes, was not a nation or a creed or a language or a state but a home. Things at home don't need an explanation. They are there because they are there. England historically was a class-based society in which there were ruling elites who governed on behalf of the nation as a whole. America was founded by Puritans from a Menasha background who saw themselves as a new Israel bound by a covenant but was not a society of rulers and ruled but rather one of collective responsibility. Hence the phrase central to American politics but never used in England pol English politics. We the people. By making, again, because no, no, it's not a bad or good thing, it's that Ephraim is aristocratic rule and Menashe is representative. And this is a, you look at the culture and the facts on the ground, you see how right Yair Davidi's sharp analysis of these two different faces of 10 Israel looking at each other across the Atlantic. By making the Israel the Israelites, a nation of storytellers, and which that's what Judah has been doing, and that's what Ephraim has been doing in its own way, but now they have to tell the story not of uh, leprechauns or pagan gods, they have to tell the story of their brothers and sisters, of their ancient heritage. So Moses helped the sages, the scribes, the rabbis, Moses helped turn us into a people bound by a collective responsibility to one another, to the past and the future, and to God. And by framing a narrative that successive generations would make their own and teach to their children, Moses, the sages, the scribes, turned the Hebrew nation, turned Israel into a nation of leaders. Again, I thank um, Jonathan Sachs's uh, insights. And... Uh, I wish you a good evening. Night is falling, Jerusalem is getting colder, and we're expecting rain. And rain is a good thing for us. Very good.